Hello, hello, and welcome back. We've got our third snapshot, 22W44A, to look at today. That includes another round of inventory tweaks, more changes to the spawner, some new spawn eggs, and improvements to the chiseled bookshelf. So let's dive right into it. We have to start this week's snapshot with my favorite change though, of course, with chiseled bookshelves now being compatible with hoppers. This is so exciting. Given that the chiseled bookshelf already had redstone capabilities, I was really hoping that they would add this functionality to them, and it's a big improvement for the practical use of these new functional blocks. I've mentioned previously that I still have some issues with how useful the bookshelf is going to be for a lot of players, given that it's currently still difficult to keep track of where you placed a specific book. If I placed a few mending books in one of these bookshelves, for example, I'd have no idea where to find them. Unfortunately, without a UI or some kind of color coding system, it's going to be pretty challenging to organize all of your books. But let's say you had a bunch of mending books, and you had one dedicated bookshelf that you wanted to place all of them in for quick and easy access. This is impossible, you say. Bookshelves can only hold six books at a time, everyone knows this. Well, not anymore, my friends, because now, with a strategically placed hopper, you can have a bookshelf that just keeps on giving. In this week's snapshot, hoppers are now able to feed books into the chiseled bookshelf. So, if you did have a dedicated bookshelf full of mending books, with a hopper connected from behind, along with a chest that's full of them, you could just walk up to a bookshelf and grab as many as you need right off the shelf, and it will instantly refill that empty slot, giving the illusion that the bookshelf is holding way more than six books. And technically, you wouldn't even really need the chest if you just wanted to access regular books. A hopper has five inventory slots available, and each can hold a full stack of 64 books. Times five, that's a total of 320 books that you could just have ready in a single block space behind the bookshelf, which in most cases would be more than enough. And that would give you the ability to pull out as many books as you need from the bookshelf. The potential here is endless. I can honestly imagine so many unique ways that this could be used to sort books. And that, combined with its redstone comparator capabilities, gives us a lot of creative options for how we'll be able to use the chiseled bookshelves in this update. Okay, so I want to showcase in just a little bit more detail how the new hopper mechanics work. A quick refresher, hoppers, when receiving a redstone signal, lock, so nothing can go in and nothing can come out. When the signal is removed, the hopper resumes its function. So you could imagine a scenario where a hopper that is fed into a bookshelf is locked so that the bookshelf itself functions as normal. And upon flicking a switch, the bookshelf, which is nearly empty, begins to fill back up, one book at a time, until it's full. And it doesn't matter where the hopper is placed, as long as its input is facing the bookshelf, it will work from any face of the block. But wait, hold on a minute, what about the other way around? Can hoppers pull books out of the chiseled bookshelves? Yes, yes they can. Again, we can see here when the hopper is locked, the books remain in the bookshelf like normal, but as soon as we unlock it, each book gets pulled out one by one and placed in the chest. So, for example, you could have something set up where you have a hopper feeding books in, and a hopper feeding books out, and when you flip a switch, the books begin getting filtered through into a shulker box. And then, when you're ready, you could flip it off, grab your shulker box, and be on your way. Or you could have some system set up where books get pulled out of one bookshelf and then placed into another. Or maybe even a setup where, using a bunch of redstone behind the scenes, you can push a button to add a book, and push another button to remove a book. I don't know, this is just me playing around with a small handful of potential possibilities, so I can imagine that with a lot more time, redstone players will be able to come up with all kinds of really neat contraptions. Again, I still see myself as a redstone novice, so I'll leave that up to the redstone community. Alright, let's move on to the spawner, or more accurately, as of this snapshot, it's been renamed the Monster Spawner to match how it's named on Bedrock Edition. In the previous snapshot, they finally added the spawner to the creative inventory for easier access for most players. But when you place it down, by default, its spawn type was automatically set to a pig, which was really disruptive and kind of annoying. But that's no longer the case. Now monster spawners don't have a default mob assigned to them when you place one down from the creative inventory. And because no mob has been defined yet, it also won't emit any of those fiery particles that you get when spawners are active. It'll just look like a really cool decorational block. I'm really glad they made this change because I feel like I can now actually have a moment to think when I'm placing a spawner down before a bunch of pigs that I didn't ask for start spawning everywhere. If I were designing a custom dungeon, for example, I could place one down, take a step back to see if it looks good, and then hold off if I needed to before deciding which monster I wanted to add. Maybe I hadn't decided yet. And again, I could do this without worrying about several pigs spawning in my dungeon. And to make things even easier, I can also use the mouse wheel pick block to grab onto one if I didn't already have one in my hotbar, which wouldn't have been possible before when they were only accessible via commands. 
And check this out, when you hover over the monster spawner item in the creative inventory, it now tells you how to set the spawner using the spawn eggs. I really like that, it means players can actually learn how to use these spawners in-game without relying on the Minecraft wiki or a YouTube video like this one. And I'm a big fan of having more intuitive ways in-game like this for players to learn how things work. Now, let's look at some of the changes they've made to spawn eggs. This one is actually a big quality of life change and a real time saver. So they've added four new spawn eggs to the game, for mobs that previously either needed a command to summon, or needed to be built in-game with actual blocks. So you probably know which two mobs I'm talking about. The first two eggs they added are the Iron Golem and the Snow Golem. Normally, in a survival world, to make these mobs yourself, you would have to physically arrange the proper blocks in the right order to spawn one in. And in creative mode, you'd have to do the same thing. If you needed to spawn in 20 iron golems for some project, you'd have to build each one block by block. And yes, you would have unlimited resources to do so, but that is still a very time-consuming process, and completely unnecessary. So now, we don't have to worry about that anymore. We can quickly spawn in as many as we need with the click of a button. And the same thing goes for the snow golem. Now, the other two spawn eggs are for mobs that are a little bit more dangerous and chaotic, and a little bit griefy, so for good reason, these two eggs have been hidden behind the give command. We're of course talking about the eggs for the end dragon and the wither. So even though they have their own spawn egg now, you'll actually have to use a command to give yourself these eggs. You know, so players don't accidentally spawn a wither into their world that immediately starts destroying all of their hard work. And they also changed the color of the polar bear spawn egg, to help set it apart from the gas spawn egg. Okay, fair enough. And of course, we have yet another, possibly final, round of tweaks to the creative inventory, based on even more player feedback. The big one here is the addition of operator blocks and items to the redstone blocks tab. But these items will only be present if you have the required permissions if you're on a multiplayer server. If you're in a single player world, that shouldn't be an issue. These are actually blocks I've never really gotten around to using much before, mostly because they've been hidden, out of sight, out of mind. But those who do use them will know, they're actually very useful, and easily accessible now by all players who may not have even known they existed. Now, I'm not going to go through how all these blocks work in detail because, to be honest, I'm still learning myself. But basically, the command block just gives the player the ability to assign various commands to a physical block in the game that the player can then activate using redstone, which is pretty neat. The jigsaw block allows you to spawn in specific Minecraft structures, and the structure void block is also used for structures. The barrier block is used to build impenetrable barriers that can't be broken in survival world and are also invisible to the players in survival. The light block gives you an invisible light source, and the debug stick gives the player the ability to edit the state of blocks, all of which are very useful. And then, they also added several items and reordered many of the tabs throughout the creative inventory. In the functional blocks tab, they added tinted glass and the bee nest since they're both functional blocks. They moved the respawn anchor before the beds. And they also moved the end portal frame and the infested blocks into this tab over from the natural blocks tab. And then the pressure plates were also reordered here by their functionality, which had something to do with the odd placement of the weighted pressure plates. In the redstone blocks tab, they added the chest, the barrel, the cauldron, the furnace, and the composter. In the building blocks tab, they added the chain and the block of amethyst. And they also moved the redstone block and the coal block into this tab from the natural blocks tab. In the crafting tab, ancient debris was added. And then, in order to create better consistency between all of the tabs, they reordered parts of the building blocks tab, the natural blocks tab, and the consumables tab, including reordering the ore materials and blocks across these tabs as well as grouping cactus and sugarcane together, and fixing the order of mushroom-related blocks from the overworld and nether. From the looks of it, they seem to be nearly finished polishing up the creative inventory, so hopefully, by next week's snapshot, it'll be nearly completed. Okay, so, they also made a series of technical changes in this snapshot, involving a handful of new game rules. To start, they added some new game rules to the drop rate of blocks and items that are destroyed by explosions. So, there are three to be exact, and when they're set to false, all the blocks destroyed by an explosion will drop. However, when set to true, each block that's destroyed will drop randomly, depending on how far they were from the center of that explosion. So, to set the game rule, all we need to do is use the command game rule, followed by the name of the game rule, and then either true or false. And our first game rule here is block explosion drop decay, all one word. It's set to true by default, so if we set it to false, all of the blocks affected by an explosion should drop. And yeah, yeah, it looks like that's the case. 
As a refresher, normally only a small handful of the blocks would drop and everything else would just be destroyed, but now that's not the case. Okay, so the second game rule here is Mob Explosion Drop Decay. Also set to true by default, if we set this one to false, all the blocks will drop specifically from mob explosions, like the creeper. Nice. And finally, we have the TNT Explosion Drop Decay game rule. This one is actually the other way around, it's actually set to false by default, so currently in the game, all blocks do actually drop from TNT explosions, and nothing is lost. But if we set that to true, that will no longer be the case. Okay, so this next one is actually really neat, and may incentivize players now to want to set up their base in a snowy biome. The Snow Accumulation Height game rule now gives the player the ability to control the layers of snow that usually form on the ground when it's snowing. Normally when it snows, up to one layer of snow forms on the surrounding exposed blocks at random, which quickly covers everything around you in snow. So by default, it's set to 1. But now, you can actually increase the number of layers that form up to 8 layers, so that when it's snowing, the snow keeps piling up, eventually to a full block of snow. That's pretty wild. Or, if you can't stand the snow because it constantly gets in the way of your building, you can actually set the game rule to 0, and the snow layers will no longer form. That's very cool. They also added two new game rules for water and lava sources that, when set to true, allow new sources of that fluid to form. By default, this is set to true for water, which is how we're able to create infinite water sources and fill up large bodies of water fairly easily. But, if you wanted to create a new challenge for yourself, you could turn that off by setting the water source conversion game rule to false. And now, no more infinite water. Lava sources, of course, are the other way around. They, by default, are set to false, so if we set the game rule Lava Source Conversion to true, it will now function like water, and you'll have access to infinite lava if you want it. And finally, they added the Global Sound Events game rule, that determines whether specific sounds are heard by everyone on a multiplayer server. So, for example, when you summon a Wither in the game, everyone on the server, no matter how far away they are, can hear that sound. So, if you wanted to disable that, you could now set it to false to avoid startling or disturbing your server mates. And last but not least, there are several bug fixes, some of which are pretty notable. For example, the bamboo mosaic blocks were previously not able to be used as furnace fuel like normal bamboo would, so that's now been fixed. And the bamboo fence gate had a missing texture that made the gates look really weird from below, so they fixed that as well. They also made some fixes to stepping sounds, related to footstep sounds not being heard when walking on carpets, lily pads, and small amethyst buds, as well as stepping sounds not being heard when walking through nether sprouts, glow lichen, crimson roots, and warped roots. And then apparently there was a bug where when mobs were placed down using a spawn egg, they would always be facing south instead of facing a random direction like they're supposed to, so that has also been fixed. And finally, there was also a bug where camels were not able to pathfind over one and a half high blocks, even though they're perfectly capable of doing so. And that is just about it for this week's 22W44A Snapshot. There were so many really great changes made to this snapshot, with the new bookshelf hopper compatibility being my personal favorite. And this is why I love tuning in every week, because it's changes like these that I'm always looking forward to, and it's nice to be able to play around with these mechanics in-game and test them myself. So far, I'm very pleased with the changes being made, and I can't wait for all the brand new features like the Sniffer and several others that we haven't even yet seen to eventually make their way into these snapshots. That'll be really exciting. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this week's snapshot. If you liked the video, please like and subscribe. That would really help me get this channel off of the ground and would make it so that you don't miss the details of future snapshots. And again, as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.